Uh, so hi everyone. Um, so today I'm going to talk about our project uh, deciphering the brain's neural code through large-scale digital simulations of cortical circuits. Uh, this is uh, a project from SUNY Downstate and a part of the ECAS project funded by NSF and Internet2. So we're going to do a brief introduction, uh, then I'll go over the main theme of our proposal, which was uh, large-scale digital models of the brain circuits. Then we'll see some applications of these models in terms of neural coding, different brain disease, and even uh, novel artificial intelligence algorithms that you can develop from this. We'll then go into some of the technology. Uh, first, some of the things we have developed as our own brain modeling tools and how we have extended them. And then also how we have used uh, Google Cloud and the different workflows we implemented. And we'll finish with a summary of the work. So I wanted to start uh, in the introduction uh, just by trying to convey the excitement that we have in the neuroscience field uh, today. So I wanna share a few uh, experiments and results uh, in the field. And I wanna start uh, with, uh, well, initially just a question, which is why do we need to study the brain? And as I mentioned also in the first, in phase one, uh, one out of four people suffer some kind of brain disorder. Uh, so this can be epilepsy, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's disease. And it's very common for, one, for everybody to know at least someone with some of these diseases. So neuroscience essentially allows us to understand these diseases better and develop treatments for them. And I wanna show an example of some research that happened this year. Scientists at the Woodside Neurosciences Institute at Stanford University have created an improved... Can you confirm if you're hearing the sound? Yeah, loud and clear. ...to let people with paralysis communicate freely and rapidly by translating brain activity to text. As part of an ongoing clinical trial, they implanted recording electrodes into the motor cortex of a man with severe paralysis and eavesdropped on the neural patterns produced as he imagined writing words by hand. And we can decode that so that we can predict with 95% accuracy which character you want to type. And we're able to do so quite rapidly at about 90 characters per minute. It's about the same rate that a person in that same age bracket, early 60s, can type on a smartphone. Okay, so I, I thought it was pretty impressive research. Uh, basically a person who's paralyzed from the neck downwards can now type on a phone at the same rate as uh, someone of the same age who's not paralyzed. This is of course using some of the understanding of the brain that we have, which unfortunately is still very limited. Uh, so uh, this can only give you an idea of the kind of things we'll be able to do once our understanding of the brain is much deeper. Scientists at the Woodside Nurse. Sorry about that. Um, so the next question I wanted to ask is why is the brain so complicated to understand? And essentially the idea is that there are many different scales of the brain and they all interact with each other. So I'm gonna try to illustrate that with this short video here. Uh, so we have the, the full brain and this is a human brain. Uh, we can see that it has an outer layer which is the gray matter where all the neurons uh, bodies are there. Uh, so that's around uh, 100 billion neurons that we have in a human brain. So yeah, I was saying, uh, so this is uh, the human brain. Uh, we have all the neurons, uh, the cell bodies are the darker parts that you see on the outside. And you can see there are many different regions. Uh, so for example, we have a region to control motor movements, which is the motor cortex. We have a region for audition, for hearing, speech, uh, the auditory cortex. And uh, the complicated thing is that all these regions are essentially interconnected with one another. And you see the white part in the center, those are axons and are sort of the highways that connect the different regions of the brain. But then if you zoom into one of these regions, you will see an extremely complicated network of neurons. Uh, there's actually around 10,000 connections uh, for each neuron. So each neuron receives inputs from 10,000 other neurons. 
Uh, so imagine the scale of complexity that we have here, but it's all really uh, well organized and we know many of the connectivity rules that dictate this uh, complex connectivity. Uh, so what makes it even more complicated is that if you zoom in to one of these neurons, you will also find a really complicated machinery and system. So for example, this is a synapse, uh, which is the way that two uh, neurons communicate. And, and there are many ionic channels that make the neuron fire electrical signals. The interesting part and what makes it difficult is that all this complicated molecular level interacts with the cellular level to make it uh, fire, to uh, generate electrical activity. And all the neurons at the network scale then interact with each other and generate the full scale, full brain scale activity. So all these different scales interact with each other and generate the activity of the brain. So how can we make sense of all this complexity? So I think we're really lucky nowadays because there is an unprecedented amount of experimental data. Uh, I'm going to show a couple of examples of massive data sets that have come out this, this year. Um, the first one is this uh, data set from Harvard and Google, who reconstructed a uh, one millimeter cube of the mouse cortex. So they essentially have the information of all the neurons and synapses that you can find in one millimeter cube, uh, which is around 200 cells, 200,000 neurons and 500 million synapses. They have information about how each of them connect to each other. And this is really valuable information to be able to understand uh, what's going on inside the brain. This data set is public avail uh, publicly available. And what's really interesting is that also this year, uh, we had the same data set from the human brain. So we have now one millimeter cube reconstruction of the human cortex with 50,000 neurons and 130 million uh, synapses. This is an incredible uh, achievement and it would be unthinkable years ago that we would have this level of resolution from a human brain. This is from the Allen Brain Institute and Princeton and it's also publicly available. So this data set, for example, shows you the different uh, structure of the cortex and these different layers, six different layers where neurons are organized. This is an example of a single neuron showing all the synaptic inputs that it receives from thousands of other neurons. And of course, having this level of resolution uh, allows uh, researchers to find the connectivity, the specific connectivity between all the cells in this reconstruction, in this piece of human cortex, which is really useful to understand uh, the circuitry and also how that relates to function and behavior. So next, uh, to link this detailed circuitry example, I want to show also some of the research uh, linking this uh, anatomy to the actual behavior and function of the circuits, as well as disease and disorders. And um, this guy here is Carl Dyserov, who many believe will be the next winner of the Nobel Prize in Medicine for discovering uh, optogenetics. And this is a, a tool that has revolutionized neuroscience. It essentially allows uh, to inspect the brain at a very specific level, knowing the different cell types in the brain and manipulating them very accurately. Um, so he's, he is going to talk in this sh very short video about how he's using this technique to understand the relation between the brain circuits and anxiety. Of course, an anxiety is something that we can all relate to at some point in our lives. So I think it's interesting to, to see how the, this is done. And optogenetics is, now allows us to very precisely understand the cells and the connections that cause the expression of these inner states to change, to be manifested, to wax and wane. And we can trace those to their cells and their connections. And a good example is anxiety. Anxiety has multiple parts to it. It's got physical, changes where you breathe faster, you, your heart goes faster. It's also got behavioral changes where you avoid risky situations, even if there's not an immediate threat. It also 
feels bad. Also, that's even a third feature to anxiety. It's got this negativity to it. All those different parts, optogenetics was used to sort out how all those different features of anxiety are brought together. There's a master control region that reaches out connections to different parts of the brain and effectively goes and gets those different features that are governed by different other parts of the brain and wraps them all up into a unified behavioral state of anxiety. That was pretty interesting to see. That gives us some insight into ourselves. That was all done with rodents, with, with mice, but because they have the same brain structures as we do, just scaled down, uh, that gave us insight into ourselves. Okay, so I thought this was a great segue into the next section, which is how we use computational models. Uh, first, because it links uh, these different scales of the brain, from the molecule, molecules to neurons to circuits, uh, up to behavior and disease. And also be, because he mentioned that he was doing this in animals, in mice and monkeys, and how these circuits in these animals are very similar to those in the human brain, and therefore they can provide us insights into the human brain. So how can simulations help understand the brain? Well, the idea here is that we have all these massive experimental data sets and each of different parts of the brain, of different phenomena, using different techniques. And so to make sense of all these experimental data, we can use uh, computer simulations to try to integrate all these experimental data into a single combined framework, a model, includes information from all these scales and from all from several different parts of the brain potentially and then we can use these models once they have been validated to make sure that they actually reproduce the same uh, phenomena that we see um, experimentally in the animals we can then use these models to um, perform experiments that wouldn't be possible with animals to have much more control over these experiments. We can simulate exact conditions. We can record from all the neurons. And therefore, it gives us a platform uh, beyond what can be done with animal experiments to try to understand uh, the brain circuits and function. Of course, the issue with this is that these very massive detailed simulations of the brain require massive computational power, supercomputers. And so, for example, one of the models that we have for one second of simulation that requires around five hours on 100 cores. Of course, we have to run thousands of these simulations to enable to uh, tune the parameters of the model, to do experiments. And so this requires massive computation. Uh, just to give an illustration, uh, each neuron that we simulate here has hundreds of compartments, each one ha having hundreds of uh, ionic channels. And so we have to compute using differential equations every millisecond. Uh, we have to solve all these differential equations to calculate the currents and the voltages of all the parts of the neuron. We then have thousands, thousands of these neurons. So this becomes a huge problem. Uh, of course, the ECAS project uh, has been fantastic in providing us with this computational power. Uh, so we have been using Google Cloud and of course, Google Cloud is an on-demand service we can use as much as we need and virtually unlimited resources. Uh, we can scale up. Uh, we have different flexible setups that we can use, and this has been incredibly, incredibly useful. So uh, in summary, the rest of the talk, we will present our, our detailed models of different parts of the brain, the motor, somatosensory, and auditory thalamocortical circuits. We've also, we will also give brief uh, descriptions of some of the insights into neural coding mechanisms, so how the brain encodes information, and some uh, brain disease and treatments that we have studied, as well as insights into potential novel AI algorithms. We have also improved uh, some of our brain modeling tools and developed new methods that now everybody can use. And of course, many of these results have been achieved or, on Google Cloud using new workflows that now can be used by the neuroscience community. And we'll describe these new brain simulation workflows on Google Cloud. Uh, this project has led to an increase in productivity. So we have 22 publications by the end of the year, 27 conference abstract, 18 grant proposals, uh, which we hope will help us continue the work. 
and we have presented the work and disseminated to other students in 16 courses, workshops, or talks. So in this section, I want to briefly describe some of these large-scale models. Uh, this work, uh, there's several people who have contributed, including two postdocs, Don Doherty and Fernando Borges, and two grad students, Joao Moreira and Erica Griffith, who will also present in a, in a minute. I want to start with our model of motor cortex. And uh, this is an animation we generated to illustrate the complexity of the model. Uh, here we are seeing the detail of the cells that we have. So they're morphologically detailed with the real shapes of the neurons. Uh, we're also showing different types in different colors that have different functions. This model is extremely detailed, so we have included data uh, from many different cell types, their location, their cell, their cell densities, the way they connect. And in particular, this model has, uh, simulates a small piece of cortex, of the motor cortex, has 10,000 neurons and 30 million synaptic connections. And it takes approximately one second, uh, sorry, to simulate one second, it takes approximately three hours on 96 cores in Google Cloud. So I just wanted to highlight one of the key results we obtained with this uh, model and where we linked this molecular level to the sort of behavioral level. Uh, so initially we started with some collaborators in, in Edinburgh uh, to reproduce the activity of the mouse brain when it changes from different states, from being quiet or not moving to actually moving in this uh, wheel. And so by changing the inputs from different parts of the brain, we were able to reproduce the activity of the mouse. So linking all these different scales in the brain. Then we looked at, at a specific condition that these experimentalists also simulated, uh, which was uh, reducing the input from a part of the brain called the locus cerebellus, which provides a neurotransmitter, neurotransmitter called noradrenaline. And the lack of this input has been associated with Parkinson's disease. Uh, the researchers actually showed uh, that in the mice, when this uh, input was removed, the mouse showed misplaced uh, 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 fit uh, in the in the wheel, so the the motor behavior of the mouse uh, was decreased. So what we did is we tried to uh, reproduce and explain these uh, circuits related to this brain lesion to Parkinson's, and show how it could be uh, associated with these misplaced movements. Uh, so we essentially, by removing this connection from the locus cerebellus and the noradrenaline input, we were able to reproduce also the activity of uh, the mouse under this condition. And what the model allowed us to do is to link then these different levels. So we link the lack of noradrenaline to blocking of a specific uh, channel in a specific cell type in the, in the model. So the layer 5B, PT neurons, uh, one of the, the channels, the HCN channel was reduced, and that is uh, what led to the changes in activity, which subsequently led to the decreased motor behavior. Another exciting work uh, with this model uh, is with a neurosurgeon here at SUNY Downstate who's examining. Um, he performs surgeries, epilepsy surgeries, to try to remove the sources of epilepsy. And he has uh, discovered that the, the location of a specific set of fast oscillations in the brain is correlated with the success of these surgeries. So we are now using this cortical model that we have developed to try to understand the mechanisms, uh, the different scales of these fast oscillations and hopefully help guide these epilepsy surgeries. Uh, next, I want to briefly mention our work with the somatosensory cortex model. And this is work mostly done by Fernando Borges, who's done a tremendous job 
So we started with this existing model of the somatosensory cortex, which was developed by the Human Brain Project, the Blue Brain Project, which is this $1 billion project in Europe. And this is an extremely detailed model with 30,000 neurons, 37, 37 million synapses, 200 different cell types. So you can see here an example of these cell types with many different morphologies taken from realistic data uh, from the brain uh, with different firing properties. So this is a really, really detailed model, uh, almost 2,000 different types of connections. Unfortunately, this model uh, is not open source, so it's not available to use by any uh, researcher in the community. Uh, so what we did is re-implement this model uh, using our modeling tool, which is open source uh, called NetPine. And so uh, we essentially had to make sure that our version of the model reproduced the original one. Here we see a comparison of the different cell types and how they fire in the same way as the original. This was a, a tremendous amount of work. Um, also in terms of the connectivity, how these different cells are connected to each other, we had to extract from some of the data that is available. Uh, so the model itself is not available, but they did publish some of the sort of parameters that they used. So we took all those and we tuned our model to try to reproduce as close as possible this original model. We have also extended it to include another key part of the brain, the thalamus, uh, which we will describe in a, in a few minutes. And of course, we have made this new version of the model open source and now available to the whole community to, to use for their own research. Uh, here's an example of the resulting uh, network simulation. On the right, you see an example of each of the cell types in the network and how the electrical activity of these uh, different cells uh, occurs. Uh, so we have made sure that this actually reproduces the original model activity and yes, to give an illustration, one second of simulation of this model required six hours on 80 cores. So the use of Google Cloud and the ECAS project here was essential to be able to, to run many of these simulations uh, to tune the parameters. Uh, the model was so large that it actually required these high memory nodes uh, with 640 gigabytes of RAM. I will now pass it on to uh, Joao, who's one of the uh, graduate students uh, working on the thalamus model. Uh, okay, yeah, thanks so much, Salva. Uh, okay, next one. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Okay, yeah, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about the thalamus model that we built for this uh, ECOS project. So just a brief description, the thalamus is this structure that's in that sits in the center of the brain, and it's known to be a really center of the information that flows all the way to the cortex. And each respective area of the thalamus has a connection with a different respective area on the cortex. And the cortex is known to be where the high level processing of information happens. But a lot of the research has shown as well that the there's a lot of pre-processing of that information in the thalamus as well. And it is also associated with many tasks such as learning, memory, and also the regulation between sleep and wakefulness states, as well as many diseases such as epilepsy, chronic pain, ALS, OCD, multiple sclerosis, or insomnia. Uh, so next one, please. Uh, and given the amount of data that has been coming out in terms of the connectivity with the thalamus and the cortex, we thought it would be really nice to close the loop by integrating the somatosensory cortex model, the M1 model, and adding a thalamus to that as well. So based on that, we looked over the literature and then we put together this model that includes 10 thalamic regions. And one of the key features that we added to the model was this uh, novel cell type specific connectivity, which means that different regions of the brain, they would target different excitatory nuclei on the thalamus, which means they would be connected directly with the regions of the thalamus that should be closing the loop. And next one, please. So here's a, a close view of the model. On the left side, we have the mouse brain atlas, and then we just highlighted uh, a few of the structures that we added in the model. I just want to point out the, the difference for this region outlined in yellow, which is the reticular nucleus. Those are inhibitory cells, so they exert this modulatory effect on the, on the cells of the thalamus. 
and the RTN is also part of the thalamus as well. And the other nuclei, which are in the middle, such as VM, VL, VPM, VPL, and POM, those are predatory nuclei, and those are the ones that target different regions of the cortex. And so we spend a lot of time and computational efforts to try to tune those connectivities and try to obtain the dynamics that were matching what we've seen in the literature. And next one, please. Yeah, here's just another overview of the connectivity pattern that we added into the into this model. From what we've seen, this is the most detailed data-driven thalamic circuit model that we have so far. Uh, the work is still under uh, study and we're publishing it Part of, we're presenting it on SFN this year, and we hopefully will bring that up to a publication uh, in the following year as well. And we implemented bidirectional connectivity with the M1 and the S1, which can be seen on the on the right side with the arrows pointing out, not only with the interconnection between the regions of the thalamus, but also uh, sending those projections respective to S1 and M1 regions. Next one, please. And another very interesting feature that we added to this model, and which is kind of something that we had to also expand a little bit uh, our net fine modeling to, was to have topological connectivity depending on the position of the cells. So this is another key feature that I haven't we haven't seen in other other uh, network models of the thalamus yet, which is to take into account the position of the cell within the 3D space. And that would be the driver of the projections that it will send to the other nuclei. And that's something that we've seen that is very crucial for processing of information in the thalamus. So we have what we call the topological connectivities, which will be the ones where the, the target cells will only be connected within a specific region, or in the cases where we have more high level processing, such as the projections that come from the cortex to the thalamus and then back to the cortex again, those are uh, what we call high order connections. So those don't have this topographical arrangement. So in that case, we use a divergence rule just to give some bit of randomness into those nuclei. And next one, please. Yeah, and these are just a highlight of some of the results that we obtained with that. So we were bo looking both at the single cell level dynamics, which has been widely reported in the literature for the thalamus, and also at the populational level, which we've seen uh, a little less data on top of that, but we can also infer based on what we've seen around. And one of the very cool things is that we were able to tune the dynamics based on the inputs that we're providing those excitatory cells. So here you can see, for example, in this uh, dotted plot on the bottom where we call TC pop, as we stimulate this specific patch of cells in the population, we can see a desynchronization on the respective RTN population in the bottom as well. And we can see a silencing of the neighboring cells, which is some of the effects that we've been seeing with the dynamic dynamics of the thalamus as you record from uh, populations that are receiving stimulus. And next one, please. And here's just a brief overview with all of those uh, populations together. Yeah, I'm sorry, I haven't explained, but the Y axis here, each one represents a single cell. And on the X axis, we have that cell firing over time. So every time we see a dot is that cell firing an extra potential. And this is a, uh, the raster plot. And you can see the reticular nuclei populations on the bottom setting the pace and being the, the ones who provide synchrony. And then on the top, the thalamocortical cells, which commun communicate with the cortex, being the ones that are forwarding the information to the cortical regions. And those are all falling within the physiological range that we've seen reported in the literature. And it's what took most of the processing time that we uh, applied in this model. Next one, please. Yeah, and just to wrap it up, we successfully connected that um, thalamus model with the M1 model and the S1 model, so motor and somatosensory cortices. Here we see a picture of the, of the raster plot with the final version tuned of the M1 and the thalamus. And it took thousands and thousands of uh, CPU, uh, GPC simulations to tune those parameters. So it was a very uh, computationally consuming work, but we finally made it. And next one, yes, for the S1 as well, the thousands of uh, GPC simulations. And then we can see the final raster plot with the tuned dynamics for the thalamus model connected with the somatosensory cortex. And next. Uh, yeah, so now the work in progress that we have now is to close the loop with this full uh, sensory motor thalamocortical loop. 
And that would include now the communication to what we call the cortical cortical projections. So those will be the fibers that in, instead of synapsing through the thalamus, they will run directly from the somatosensory cortex to the motor cortex. And that's the work that we've been putting our efforts into now. And yes, this will be the, the final picture that we are aiming towards. And yeah, we've been able to achieve a tremendous success. And I wanna thank uh, for the opportunity of applying those uh, that, that funding into this phenomenal research. And we hope to push the field forward in the network studies of the cortical, the thalamocortical loops of information. Thank you. All right. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Erica. Um, I am another graduate student. I'm working with Salvador, and I'll be talking to you today about our project on the auditory cortex. Oh, next slide. So, yeah. so here we created a model of the auditory system in macaque monkeys. And one of the main phenomena that we want to study with this model is the role of cortical oscillations in speech processing. And in this context, oscillations are the result of network scale synchrony between activity in different populations of neurons. And the specific oscillatory patterns we can see depend on you know, a wide variety of things, uh, from small scale things like neuron connectivity uh, to larger scale things like attention, neuropathology, and the surrounding environmental context. Uh, next. Um, so we developed this model to replicate the oscillatory patterns seen in macaque auditory cortex. And this is being done in collaboration with Dr. Sam Niemoten at the Nathan Klein Institute. And so for this, we really wanted to create a biologically informed model. Um, having a level of kind of biological realism allows us to generate more specific predictions about the mechanisms that drive oscillations under different experimental conditions. Um, so this model uses extant experimental data, like, you know, like the type you can see on the top right there. And this provides us with concrete information that we can use for the model's geometry, for example, the depths of each cortical layer, uh, the cell types that are present, the location and density of these cell types, connectivity patterns, et cetera. And from our collaborators um, at the Nathan Klein Institute, we also have data that's recorded directly from the brains of awake behaving macaques. And crucially, we're able to collect equivalent data from our cortical model, uh, both because of the modeling software that we're using and along with the detailed and biologically informed nature of the model itself. Uh, so that gives us a good basis for comparison. Um, next. Uh, so here I'll just take you through the pathway that we've modeled. Uh, we can start here in the periphery at the kind of bottom left where you can see a sound wave being input into the ear. Uh, now, one great thing about this model that really helps bolster its validity is that we're able to feed any arbitrary sound stimulus into the model. And that includes stimuli that we um, are presenting to our macaques. So being able to use you know, this matching stimuli for both the models and the monkeys gives us a really good basis for comparison. And so after we provide the stimulus, uh, this auditory signal is interpreted by the peripheral structures that are highlighted here in green boxes. Uh, the ones we've modeled here are the cochlea and the inferior colliculus. And so these brain structures are represented uh, using so-called phenomenological models. And these models are not very biologically detailed and instead they capture the signal transformations that are occurring in these regions. And we reserve the, you know, the biological realism for the more downstream structures whose biological activity and mechanisms we're more interested in. Um, so these phenomenological models, they produce outputs and that drives the more biologically detailed downstream structures. And these structures include the auditory thalamus and a column of primary auditory cortex, both of which are highlighted here in the blue boxes. Um, now, so these two, the A1 cortical column and the thalamus use real experimental data to set the type, location, density, connectivity of these cell models. And uh, the individual cell models that populate these regions are optimized to fit the physio physiological responses that are observed in these cell types in real life, as you can see in the panel that's on the top right there. And we also use experimental data to set the strength and probability of connection between any two given cell populations. Uh, in the middle, you can see our connectivity matrix that we use. Um, so taking this all together, uh, if we go to the panel on the bottom right, we can see a, a brief schematic of our A1 column here. Um, so our A1 column, it simulates all six layers of cortex uh, with around 12,000 neurons, and around 30 million synapses. Layer depths are matched to what we see in our macaques um, and with cell types, cell densities, connection strength, connection probability, you know, all these things being driven by data. And that gives us, um, you know, really fine-tuned granular handle on the, on the biological aspects of this system. Uh, next. 
So you know, once we have this network and it's populated with our, you know, our fitted cell types at all the proper densities and connectivities, et cetera, uh, we then have to tune our network uh, to ensure that it's behaving in a biologically realistic manner. Um, so briefly, our tuning process involves optimizing a number of network level parameters that deal with a concept called synaptic gain. And I won't go over this in too much detail, um, but suffice to say that these synaptic gain parameters, it governs the, you know, the amplification or attenuation of signals that are traveling between specified cell types. So essentially we optimize these network level synaptic gain parameters such that all of our cell populations show ecologically valid firing rates, meaning that at rest, each of our cell populations within the network has a baseline level of activity that's biologically plausible. And so this is a very, you know, it's a multi-step process that's very computationally and time intensive. Uh, we tried a number of different optimization approaches, um, you know, not just with how we approach the parameters, parameter spaces to explore with respect to the network, uh, but also with respect to the optimization algorithms themselves. Um, so a number of different optimization approaches were tested, including evolutionary optimization, adaptive stochastic descent, other things that Salvador will talk about some more later and uh, application of these algorithms to this you know, very large scale biologically detailed network required thousands of parallel simulations. And all, to, all told, uh, you know, tuning these parameters took over half a million So I think Eric has been some trouble with the connections between Vinicius. Yeah, so I'm gonna just. Um, um... Off. I'm saying the same thing, so. <laughs> uh, I'll try to mute and I can continue. Can you hear me now? Yes, um, Salvador, yes, I can hear you. Unfortunately, Erica's uh, bandwidth obviously is, uh, has dropped out a little bit at the moment. Yeah, she was having issues all morning, so we were a bit <laughs> concerned. Okay, <laughs> so yeah, I'll finish off. Um, so yeah, she was saying we used in total uh, over 500,000 simulations and 5 million core hours on Google Cloud uh, to finish the optimization of this model, which essentially would have been impossible to do without uh, Google Cloud and this project. Uh, here's another example of uh, the population firing rates of each of the uh, populations in the model and how we tried to use these analysis tools to find a good solution. And this is the, the final uh, solution once the network is tuned. So you can see all the different cells in the network are firing. And we can see the values here. They all are within biological uh, realism. And we even had these emerging oscillations that you usually see in cortex, which were no, not imposed by our sort of driving inputs. And they emerged naturally, which was very nice to see. Uh, here you can see uh, a summary of the different populations that we have. We have a lot of different cell types, uh, far more than we know of in, in other existing models. So this is the, the most detail that we know of. And what we, we've been doing is trying to, uh, once we have this model, trying to match it to exper experimental data and using actual experimental techniques to record from these models. So this is called a local field potential and you obtain it by introducing an electrode in the brain and measuring at different depths. Uh, so we can also simulate this recording technique in our models so that we can actually try to match accurately to the experimental data. So you can see here uh, experiment and simulation on the right. And uh, we've been uh, doing this for different conditions. So for example, by providing speech as input to the model and the macaque. So on the left here, you see the response of the macaque at different depths of the model, the cortical model, both in the, in the actual monkey experiments and the simulation. And we see a lot of differences, on, uh, I mean, lots of uh, similarities. Uh, there are some small differences as well that we are looking into, 
uh, but we can essentially reproduce much of the uh, activity that we can record experimentally. And so we can start using this model uh, to test theories, evaluate treatments, and so on. Uh, this is another example of spontaneous activity when the network is not being driven and how we can match uh, the activity that we record from the actual macaques, from the actual monkeys, to that recorded in the simulation. So all in all, we have a, a very realistic model of the macaque auditory circus that we can now start using to evaluate hypotheses and essentially uh, work together with our uh, colleagues to uh, gain insights into the brain function. So Bill Leeton will take over now. Yeah, so the, uh, am I easily heard? I, we're kind of a noisy background, unfortunately. Yeah, no, it's good, thanks. Okay, great. So uh, all of these new models really offer a lot of opportunities for new applications. Uh, next slide, and those include things from, uh, oh, your people. So uh, the people we will be talking about their work includes uh, Craig Kelly, Kazutaka Sakaguchi, uh, Eugenio Urdapayeta, Don Doherty, Haru Noir, Adam Newton, Sam Nimoten, Robert McDougall, and of course, uh, Salvador as well, and, and me. <laughs> Next slide. So we're going to talk some about some of our novel ideas of neural coding. Uh, these include trying to understand what the meaning and consequences of avalanches in the brain are. And this is a topic that comes up with us again and again is that the brain is really carefully tuned somewhere between stopping, which of course you never want to do and never can do until you're dead, and excessive positive feedback, which is what gives you seizures. And so the notion is that the brain has criticality, shows criticality uh, of sort that's been studied extensively in physics in the context of avalanches, whether snow avalanches or sand avalanches, which are strictly feed-forward phenomenon, whereby activation of a set of elements or one element causes activation of another and so on, causing this large feed-forward explosion. On well, the brain, again, that has to be controlled, and that's all occurring in the context of oscillation. This is work, by the way, done by Don Doherty. Next slide. And uh, what he's finding, uh, what we're finding, is a large variety of avalanche lengths, avalanches here defined by periods of activity with intervening no activity. Next slide. And uh, we can then identify these. I didn't, next slide, please, Salvador. Uh, by length, either through duration and time or by number of elements involved. And that lets us do this characteristic log log plot, which identifies the signature of criticality. It's not really a absolute thing, but it suggests that the system may be in a critical state where in the log log plot, you see this line or in a non log log plot, you see this long tail of very small avalanches with uh, relatively few, very large avalanches. Uh, this is the first model that's really looked in detail at a cortical model and thought about how could it be that these avalanches occur. Most of the models have been very abstract, uh, a physics-based models comparable to what one sees in uh, modeling of avalanches themselves. Next slide. And so this notion of criticality, uh, that this may facilitate neural commu communication without getting the risk or without re reducing the risk, because certainly epilepsy is a very common disease, reducing the risk of positive feedback that is out of control in the cortex. And so we can start to classify these avalanches, talk about which ones are longer, which ones are shorter, which ones are associated with the different brain waves that are well characterized in human brain, as well as animals, delta, theta, alpha, most famously, uh, and, and think about then what they mean in terms of coding. Next slide, please. Uh, another project we've been looking at, the ideas relating to the importance of temporal coding in the functioning of the nervous system. So those who are familiar, and I'm sure most of you will be more familiar with deep learning than you will be with this kind of detailed neural networks, perhaps know that the individual neural units 
in a deep learning network are highly simplified. They are really what we call uh, sum and squash units. They summate inputs linearly, and then they squash them to a binary output, negative one to one, zero to one, either one. And that we regard, and, and these models, remarkable as they are, clever as they are, and all the things they've been able to do are very different than the way the brain works. And the brain really uses a lot of timing and necessarily uses a lot of timing. We talk about the auditory system, we are talking about a frog catch, catching a fly. The timing is critical. And we believe that these oscillations, the times of spikes on oscillations is very important for coding. It's an idea that came, uh, what's well, been around for a long time, but I, I like the idea as expressed by uh, Lisman. Famously, he talked about how you can do a code where you have a certain number of the very fast gamma oscillations on top of a single cycle of theta oscillations. So we're doing a lot of measurements with that. Next slide, please. Uh, similarly, we're trying to explode the neuron. So I said these simplified deep learning networks use sum and squash. Well, the neuron itself has all of these internal resonance properties. And I know uh, Don Segev, one of our colleagues in Israel, has a recent paper talking about how the individual neuron would really represent, in terms of its capacity for information transmission, a relatively large, um, I think it was a 32 layer deep, deep learning network. And so the way we're studying that is, again, thinking about the temporal meaning. And uh, this is a study that was published recently by us, uh, done by Craig Kelly, where we're looking at how the different types of cells, how the different parts of the cells may differentially resonate. And then we think about, well, how does that fit into the network, which also has its own resonant properties? So the cell resonating in the context of the network. Next slide, please. Uh, just uh, more detail about that, uh, looking at the individual types of resonance patterns that we were able to see. Next slide, please. Uh, a different notion of coding came uh, from our work with uh, Surgeon Antic, who's a uh, physician, uh, but primarily a researcher at University of Connected Farmington. Uh, he has a lot of data relating to what are called NMDA plateaus. So there are a lot of different neurotransmitters in the brain, in the human cortex, two of the very important ones are glutamate and GABA, GABA amino butyric acid. And these are uh, ubiquitous, they're everywhere, uh, but there are many different kinds of cells and some of the most interesting cells, at least the ones that really have caught a lot of attention because of their enormous size and their extreme metabolic cost, are these pyramidal cells here represented on the left by this, uh, it's a, more or less a, what a tracing would look like. That in yellow there, the soma, then what's called the apical dendrite at the top up to these tufts and what are called basilar dendrites at the bottom. And so our notion is again, that this cell, which has this enormous computational, potentially enormous computational complexity untapped by us, tapped by the brain, but un, un, not understood yet by us, could be doing all kinds of things within the network, which has projections at very many different layers corresponding to these different types of what are called dendrites that you see here. And these would be the inputs of the cell. Uh, so one of the ideas that uh, Dr. Anta came up with is this idea that a set of inputs here represented in yellow could activate a particular dendrite. And that activation would still be what's called subthreshold. It would not be sufficient to cause the cell to generate an output. However, it would be sufficient to put that particular dendrite in a preparatory state. And we like to imagine that that preparatory state could be something like a Bayesian prior. If you have a prior idea of what may come next. And what comes next then are these other inputs in red and by then taking the, the cells that are prepared, the, sorry, the dendrites that are prepared, activating some of them, we could then understand an input in the context of this Bayesian prior. So this is something that we've modeled in great detail at the level of the individual cell, but uh, still needs to remodel, frankly, and, and put in the context of the network. Next slide. 
So a big interest of ours, and I'm a, a practicing neurologist, I see patients, is to look at the applications of these things in the terms of diseases and treatments for particular diseases. And we've covered a lot of diseases, but we'll just talk about a couple of them here. Uh, so one thing we've done, this was with a, a visiting sabbatical professor who is uh, Kazutaka uh, Sagaguchi from Japan, is to look at the details of spinal cord circuits. And so uh, the spinal cord, we don't think about that much, of course, as long as it works, uh, as with most, most of our brain, as long as it works, we don't have any concerns, we don't have any worries. Uh, but of course, people who have injuries, uh, people who have injuries even to their limbs where they're getting aberrant inputs to their spinal cord, we do have problems and we need to think about how to treat those. And so we've been developing this fairly sophisticated model using the resources uh, from ECAS on the Google Cloud platform to identify how a circuit like this might work. And uh, on the lower left there, you can see a, a simplified circuit diagram. There are many more cells represented in the circuit. And on the right there, you can see the, what's called the spiking pattern, how the cells activate in response to different kinds of inputs. Next slide, please. So uh, we then generate a raster plot, as you've seen in many of these other examples here in the upper left, showing the firing of the different types of cells. And we can generate, uh, identify activation patterns that would be expected from different intensities of pain versus touch inputs, so as to see really what would this, uh, what would these set of cells do, how do they do it, and to think about how we could treat people with what's called neuropathic pain, people who come in where just a touch on their skin is sufficient to create an enormous pain sensation. So uh, there exists the possibility of, uh, of various surgical interventions but most of these have not worked. Uh, various types of ion channel interventions, most of these haven't worked. And we can test a lot of these in generating a rational pharmacotherapeutic uh, approach to these diseases, where we look again across these many scales. So we think about the ion channels, in particular the sodium channel, which is really the most important in generating spikes and generating signals which kind of sodium channel. It turns out there are at least nine kinds of channel, sodium channels. And it's been thought that what's called NAV, sodium NAV voltage dependent, NAV 1.7 is the one that may be critical for pain. So we can test this in the context of our model, in the context of pain fibers and pain circuitry. And then we can also look at the different cells and how they respond individually and think about, well, probably not individual cell ablation, but something that Salvador mentioned earlier, these recent findings by uh, Dizaroff, recent development by Dizaroff and uh, by um, Boyden, the MIT colleague, uh, of optogenetics, where we have the notion that we can identify certain cell types and activate or inactivate those cell types specifically with a laser, which in a human would be an embedded laser. Um, next slide, please. So another disease, of course, in some ways the most important disease, that's a neurological disease because it's uh, so prevalent and so debilitating and such a major cause of death is stroke. Uh, in fact, the NIH, National Institute of Health, their, uh, their, their institute is called the National Institute of Neurological Disease and Stroke because stroke is as important as all the other diseases, in a sense. So stroke is caused by a lack of oxygen to the brain. And so it's like a heart attack, but it's the brain, so the brain attack. Um, and what happens is initially you have perhaps a relatively small piece of tissue that's really dead and it's not going to be recovered. But after that, you have spread of various toxins, and of activation through mechanisms that include a spread of potassium, most importantly, causing what is called the penumbra, an area that would be salvageable, to become ischemic, ischemic meaning lacking oxygen, and to uh, become unsalvageable. So you can get these enormous growth 
of a stroke in the context of uh, an initially relatively small stroke. So we looked for, we meaning the community of neurologists and neurosurgeons, various neuroprotective strategies. They've mostly failed. And so we're really looking in detail with these models. And they, now here we have a model of the single cell. And on the right, something, I think a level we haven't shown really before is the enormous complexity of the individual cell, not only in terms of its electrical activity, but also in terms of the chemical activity. So there's a whole chemophysiology that complements the electrophysiology. And that involves what's called second and third messengers, cascades of messengers, calcium, cyclic AMP, G proteins, connectivity within the cell that's mediated by chemical processes. And here's a study that was done by Adam Newton, where we look at how a cell that's once activated now spreads its own cellular level penumbra, its own cellular level cloud of potassium around itself due to all this activation. Uh, and then subsequently, in the next slide, we'll see positive feedback, uh, well, same slide, sorry, here, positive feedback of a spread of a cloud of potassium causing activation of cells throughout a large amount of tissue. And note that this is not dependent on synaptic connections between cells. This is simply a cloud of potassium causing activation of other cells that then is a set of embedded positive feedback systems that eventually can lead to cell death. And this particular simulation was done by Adam Newton and Craig Kelly together. Um, next slide, please. How are we doing time? Not bad. Okay. Uh, another uh, area entirely different is to come back all the way around to understanding and developing new approaches to AI, to engineering of intelligence systems based on what we are able to now understand about the complexity of even the individual cell. And again, what we're trying to get is that we're exploding conceptually the individual cell, which in the deep learning paradigm is simply linear summation and binarization through squashing that value from zero to one. Next slide, please. So this is a study that was done by uh, Harun Anwar, working with Sam Moten primarily, where they took a simple game uh, here, also done under ECAS auspices, but also the auspices of the Army research uh, effort, a simple game of Pong, and tried to develop a partially feed-forward system, so we're not really getting the full recurrence that we know is there in the nervous system, to learn the game using reinforcement learning. Uh, fairly complicated task, certainly very complicated compared to just modeling a single part of cortex or thalamus, uh, where we involve a, a simulated visual cortex and then kind of projecting directly to, uh, to motor output. Next slide, please. So uh, we do a variety of types of reinforcement learning with various degrees of selectivity. Those who are familiar with reinforcement learning will recognize that one of the problems is that you have uh, a difficult credit assignment problem, which is what deep learning helps you solve, where you don't really know who caused the aberrant movement in this case uh, and who to, to, to fix, which synapse to fix. Next slide, please. Um, so we can show that we certainly are not going to do as well. Next slide. I think the movie comes up next. Uh, we're, probably, we're not going to do as well as a straightforward engineered solution, but it's impressive that given the complexity, well, given on the one hand the complexity of our model, and on the other hand the simplicity of our model relative to a brain, we are able to teach the system to play. As you can see, it, it moves correctly and manages to hit the darn ball most of the time. And on the right, you can see uh, various aspects of the learning and the activation at different levels of the model. Next slide, please. Um, and I think that's it, right? Okay. Hey, Salvador, great. back to you. Yep, thank you so much, Bill. Uh, yeah, so now I wanna move on to uh, the technology and dissemination aspects of the model, of the project, sorry. Um, and just to mention, of course, uh, all the research that Bill described was using Google Cloud and in many cases required 
for example, in this last case, uh, training uh, the model during very large periods of time that was only possible thanks to using the Google Cloud resources. Uh, so in these technology aspects, uh, we had collaborations with uh, Metacell, which is a software company uh, who helped develop the, the graphical interface for, for our tool, as well as with several universities, EPFL and Yale, and several of the uh, members involved were Fernando Borges, Don Doherty, and Joe Graham. So we'll start looking at some of the brain modeling tools that we have been able to extend and develop using this project. And the, the main one, the first one, of course, is NetPine, which is our multi-scale brain modeling tool for uh, brain circuits. And this is an open source tool. It's been used by over 50 labs and we have over 80 models already implemented using this tool. Uh, key features that it has this very advanced and state-of-the-art graphical interface where you can build the whole models, the, the neurons, the networks of neurons, simulate them and visualize them and perform analysis. This is being hosted on Google Cloud using Kubernetes uh, in order to allow multiple users to connect at the same time. And we have used it for many courses and uh, research. So one a really interesting feature that we have been working on during this last year, and which has been facilitated by having these Google Cloud credits, is the ability to use the GUI to run these parameter explorations. Uh, so when you have a model and you wanna investigate something in it, what you usually do is select some of the parameters of the model and uh, play around with different values. And of course you wanna do this automatically so it is now possible from this graphical interface to set a, a set of parameters that you wanna explore, uh, select a range of values and automatically submit all the simulations that will be required to explore this. And this can be, for example, to simulate the specific treatments or different conditions, experimental conditions in the model. And so uh, as far as we know, this is the first uh, tool it has a graphical interface to, uh, that allows you to do these kind of uh, explorations online. And additionally, we have been working on allowing to run all these simulations using different platforms. Uh, one of them, of course, is uh, Google Cloud. Uh, so we're finalizing now uh, this uh, new feature where you will be able to submit these simulations directly to Google Cloud uh, using uh, deployed clusters, SLARM clusters, and once the simulations are completed, you would receive the simulation results back into the uh, graphical interface of the simulation tool. Uh, this, of course, has been done uh, using the, the current Google Cloud credits. Uh, another advancement of these tools that we have integrated with existing platforms, uh, particularly the open source brain, uh, which is a large project from uh, UC UCL in, in London. And they provide a really nice file management system that adds to the features of, the, of this tool. And so now users can have their own workspaces where they can have their own files, their own uh, models, they can clone from GitHub and essentially it provides a, an online working environment to the, develop these models and run simulations. We have also now managed to integrate our tool with the Human Brain Project eBrains platform. Uh, so now you can run these simulations, uh, these NetPine tool simulations uh, on their platform. And we're also finalizing the integration of the graphical interface. So you will also be able to use their resources, including uh, disk space and file management, as well as computational uh, resources, supercomputers, uh, to run these uh, NetPine uh, tool simulations. Something we are very excited about uh, was the, uh, is the course that we organized for the first time. Uh, this was a two week, 80 hour course. Uh, it was online, of course, because of COVID, uh, but it was focused specifically on our brain modeling tool, on this NetPine tool and their underlying simulation engine, which is called Neuron. Uh, we had 87 applicants from 21 countries, which we were very pleased to see. And because this was a very hands-on course where we wanted to focus on, on the students and help them uh, go through the exercises and have like very uh, personalized uh, support, 
we selected only 20 applicants. Uh, we must say we selected them based on merit and 60% uh, of them were female. Uh, we had a wide range of uh, different levels of expertise from undergrads to faculty. And uh, of course, the course was hosted, uh, well, the NetPine GUI, which was used for the course, was hosted on, on Google Cloud using Kubernetes. And we had many of the students running this, uh, this tool at the same time uh, and running the different simulations and exercises of the, of the course, as well as developing their own models. Uh, we had a, a set of presentations at the end uh, with the modeling projects of each of the students, and we were really impressed by the level of the, the resulting models. So we have uh, videos and presentations of all of these. And we have made all the material of the course available online through YouTube. We have over 40 hours of uh, training videos to use this tool, as well as on the on the neuroscience background of what these different uh, tools can do, uh, the computational methods we use, and the underlying biology. Uh, we are actually building a, a dedicated website for this course, uh, so it's easier to access the whole, also the slides, as well as the exercises in Jupyter Notebook. And we hope this, this course can become available uh, publicly to everyone and be useful to the, the, the community. Uh, one of the other technologies we've been uh, developing uh, is this uh, core neuron simulation engine. Uh, so this is uh, work done by the Blue Brain project and we have collaborated very closely with them. Uh, so <clears throat> a few years ago, the, they released this new version of the tool, which is essentially extends or improves uh, the neuron simulator, uh, which as you can see here is the most widely a uh, used simulation tool for this kind of models that we build, very biophysically detailed at multiple scales. And so this new uh, simulation engine managed to achieve speed ups of up to seven times and uh, memory reductions of the same level uh, by implementing all these calculations in a more efficient way and focused on high performance computing. Uh, it also for the first time enabled simulations of this uh, neuron simulation tool on GPUs, which we have started to implement as well. So we have been working closely with them uh, to evaluate this new tool, the core neuron simulation engine on our large scale models. So we have tested it on this motor cortex model here on the left, and we achieved a speed up of <coughs> uh, 3.6. So it went from taking almost three hours to uh, taking 45 minutes, which was uh, really gratifying to see for us. Uh, we, we had been running these three hour simulations uh, for one second for a few years. And, and so now we are very happy to see this speed up. And we've also uh, recently tested it on this massive uh, somatosensory cortex model, uh, which where we have all also achieved a significant speed up of two times uh, two times two, uh, sorry, 2.2 and reducing it from uh, over seven hours to uh, less than three. Uh, so uh, we're also looking into ways of in improving the speed ups further. And we have, we are just finishing to try out these GPUs. Uh, so we had some technical difficulties in the whole uh, moving on to core neuron that we have solved together with them, including compilation of the different uh, files used in the, in the models. And so now we should be able very soon to run these models on GPUs and we expect to have um, even larger speed ups for the different models. Uh, additionally, we've been uh, working and developing uh, many different parameter opti optimization methods. Uh, this is key to the models that we develop since they are so uh, large scale and so detailed and we need to uh, use methods that automatically uh, match them to experimental data because it's impossible to do by hand. And so we've uh, worked with uh, evolutionary or, or genetic algorithms. Uh, we then moved on to this uh, Optuna package, which is a high hyperparameter optimization framework used mostly for machine learning. Uh, but it seems uh, we discovered it works very well for our, our models as well, and it's more efficient than the evolutionary algorithms. Uh, we develop methods where we tune the models uh, in a layer by layer fashion, and that allows us to, uh, to obtain better results. 
And of course, we've implemented all these models and adapted them, the, adapt them, them to the uh, Google Cloud workflows so that they can be used in the future by other researchers. In terms of the Google Cloud uh, technologies and workflows that we follow, uh, of course, the main thing that we've been using is this idea of uh, Google Cloud Slurm uh, clusters. Uh, so we deploy this cluster using the latest version uh, using this Terraform tool. And uh, they include this Slurm workload manager, uh, which is very convenient to uh, submit the different jobs. We have that adapted our tool, NetPine, to work with Slurm very closely and seamlessly to the user. Um, so this setup allows several users from the lab to connect to the logging node of this cluster and submit their own jobs, <coughs> manage the jobs, see the queues, and so on. We use uh, this idea of compute images where we have pre-installed or all our tools in, into one of these images and this uh, provisions the compute nodes so that it's very easy to deploy and uh, run the simulations. We also use Google buckets to store the information from the output of the simulations and to load some of the experimental data that we need to run the simulations. And of course, uh, some of these clusters will use the idea of these uh, preemptible nodes, uh, which are much cheaper and um, much more efficient, especially for, uh, for large scale simulations. So they are very cost efficient for us and they have allowed us to run all these massive simulations. And we've also started using uh, this idea of or feature of the bulk API, which assigns in a much more efficient way um, the different nodes that will be used uh, by the uh, computing cluster. It's specifically within a region, it will select the, the nodes that are available. Uh, of course, using this technology, we have able we were able to reach 100,000 simultaneous scores, uh, which was a proof of concept to show that we can scale this, this app uh, if needed. Um, the nice thing about this setup is that we, we usually had several of these clusters deployed because uh, we had different requirements for different users. Uh, so some, for example, could not use the preemptible nodes because we're running very long simulations and this require non-preemptible nodes. We also had our other clusters to test new features such as these placement policies that we've been uh, testing, evaluating in order to run much faster simulations uh, where all the, the computer nodes are within the same physical region. And so that allows to have very low internal latencies. And so uh, the nice thing is that we could have these several clusters deployed. They would all share the same buckets. Uh, so you can, we can use the same buckets for all the clusters and store the data from each of the users. And of course, we could use the same compute images to uh, uh, provision each of the clusters. Additionally, as I mentioned before, we were using Kubernetes uh, autoscalable clusters for the, uh, the tool, the graphical user interface based tool that was deployed online. Uh, so this allowed us to have like a, a basic one or two nodes uh, that were always online, but if more users started using the tool, this cluster would grow automatically. For example, we've done courses at conferences where, where over 40, 50 people connected at the same time. And so this auto-scalable cluster was able to cope with that uh, demand of resources. And uh, the nice feature of Google Cloud is its flexibility, of course. And, and we use this, for example, uh, several members of the lab uh, had the need to use individual virtual machines uh, with different um, capacities, for example, some may only needed small clusters, uh, sorry, small virtual machines with 16 cores for specific jobs. Others needed higher number of cores and potentially higher memory. Uh, so these users were able to create their own virtual machines with very specific custom specifications for their own needs and run them. And of course, we're also now starting to uh, play with these GPUs uh, to run these simulations using core neural. So just want to finish with uh, a summary and some of the initially some of the lessons we've learned during ICAS. Um, so 
our conclusion is very clear, and it's that these commercial cloud resources uh, have vastly accelerated our research. So we've done things in, in one or two years that would have been uh, unthinkable uh, before. Uh, first, because of the sort of almost unlimited resources that we can access, for example, these 100,000 cores at the same time, uh, but also the lack of limitations, for example, no waiting times in queues, and uh, no limit on the, the amount or the duration of the simulations, uh, the immediate availability of the resources, as well as the uh, ability to customize. So as I was saying, we can use different setups. Some require high memory, others require GPUs. We can use Kubernetes for the uh, uh, web application. And so uh, these commercial resources from Google Cloud provided us with all those uh, needs. Uh, we also had some challenges, and of course, the first one was that the uh, the research we were doing was quite intensive. Um, so this required a lot of time and personnel. Uh, so, for example, something that was really uh, resource intensive was the search to build the models requires looking into the into the literature, into the data sets, uh, to extract all the thousands of parameters that we are using to the models. And so that requires a, a large amount of time that um, uh, was sort of a bottleneck at some points in terms of using the, the actual supercomputing resources. Also, we were developing these new methods, for example, to optimize the models. And we were like in unexplored terrain because we hadn't, and almost no one had built these such large scale models and tuned them. Uh, so it was hard to find the methods. And so we're trying, uh, try and error uh, for many of these things. Uh, the next one was, of course, all these new technologies that we were using uh, in Google Cloud and the setup of these technologies, the clusters, the different features. Uh, they require a lot of uh, very technically specialized training and support. And we did receive that from, from Google and some from the Internet2 guys as well. Uh, but in the end, of course, it is us who had to implement these features. And that, of course, required also a lot of training uh, for the different users in the lab and learning ourselves of how these different things uh, worked. Uh, also, some of these features were sort of experimental and very recent, so there wasn't that much documentation. And we were learning together with the Google guys as these features were uh, released. And finally, some of the delays, initial delays, came from the administration side at the university level. Uh, signing these cloud uh, contracts had never been done before, so we had to agree on the conditions of the contracts. Also, the payment uh, administration of the funds and the payment of, of invoices was somehow problematic during, the, uh, during this period. And so some of these issues have already been resolved, and we hope that, that for the future it will be easier to work with. Uh, so the science enabled by the ECAS project, uh, first of all, uh, the development of these really large scale detailed models of different parts of the brain that now not only include these cortical circuits, but are also connected to these uh, thalamic circuits, which as uh, Joao explained, are really the key entry point to the brain. And so we have these full thalamocortical loops, which uh, we, we think are going to be really important into figuring out the details of how the brain works. Uh, we've also uh, seen uh, some examples of how, the, how we have looked into the, how the brain encodes information, different neural coding mechanisms, including these avalanches, oscillations, the importance of dendrites beyond uh, what the simple neurons of artificial intelligence can do as well as some of these insights that the sort of brain and biological circuits provide into how learning works, for example, and how these can be potentially extrapolated to developing a novel artificial intelligence algorithms. And finally, our final objective of, for all these models is to try to understand the brain and how disease works, uh, disease work, and how we can develop new treatments for this disease. Uh, we have looked at some of these uh, properties for Parkinson's disease, uh, some of the insights looking at schizophrenia, how ischemia is propagated in the brain, how the different pain circuits work and what we can do to ameliorate this pain, as well as the uh, origins of epilepsy and how to improve epilepsy surgeries. 
Uh, next, some of the technology enabled by the ECAS project. As we're saying, uh, the, the NetPine tool, uh, which is this open source modeling tool that can be used by the whole community and has a really state-of-the-art graphical interface, which was uh, developed uh, largely for, uh, thanks to this uh, project and the Google Cloud resources we had. The core neuron simulation tool, simulation engine, which makes it much faster. And we have helped to test and improve and as well as this set of parameter optimization methods that we have now provided uh, for the whole community building these kind of models to use. And of course, a set of workflows and methods uh, specific to Google Cloud that can be used to, for this kind of brain modeling projects. First of all, this multi-user flexible setup that we use for the lab, uh, where many users can connect to their own uh, resources depending on what they need. And these used uh, Slurm GCP clusters, Terraform, preemptible nodes, disk images, buckets, bulk API. We were also able to run very large parallel simulations in over 100,000 cores, uh, very long duration simulations uh, that took over four days. Um, we started playing with displacement policies and hope to run, be able to run these very fast multi node simulations. And of course, we used Kubernetes uh, to deploy this web application in a very efficient way. Um, just in our lab, we have uh, really accelerated the productivity and we've seen uh, eight journal papers published, uh, four are under review and other, another eight are in preparation in very late stages. We hope by, by the end of the year to have most of them submitted. Um, we also published two conference papers and 20, 27 conference abstracts. Uh, this is just in our lab, but our tool has also helped uh, several, several other labs and universities. So uh, we expect that the actual number of papers would, will be much larger. We've also been very active in the dissemination space. So we have uh, given a total, of, a total of 16 courses, workshops, and talks across different conferences, Society for Neuroscience, Computational Neuroscience, a course in Brazil, and uh, including even a talk organized by uh, National Science Foundation uh, describing the cloud bank uh, technology. And we've also made uh, much of this material available online, including both the talks, uh, the tutorials from our two week course, as well as some uh, Google Cloud instructions or guide that we had created for our, for our own lab and we're now also publishing online uh, to make it available for the community. And finally, uh, of course, uh, we are very lucky that we've uh, been able to use this research to uh, submit new grants. And we have received already uh, seven uh, grants awarded based on some of the results from this project. Uh, this includes, for example, uh, a large amount of computation time on this human brain project uh, um, over 8 million core hours on the eBrains Human Brain Project supercomputers, a similar amount on the Exceed uh, NSF. We have also received a, a three year grant from the Parkinson's Association. And we have 12 other grants uh, submitted to many of them to NIH and NSF, uh, which we hope will provide funding to continue this research. Uh, Finally, we'd like to thank all the, the ECAS team and Internet2, which have, has been uh, fantastic. They've really helped us with this project. And of course, uh, both NSF and Internet2 for providing these resources, as well as, well as our other uh, funding uh, um, mechanisms. So here is a list of the researchers involved, as well as other collaborators, institutions that collaborated with us. And if you want to know more, you can check our lab websites here at the bottom right. Thank you so much. Great. Uh, thank you, Salvador. Um, I do have a, a, we're a little over time, so uh, uh, I don't actually have uh, any questions in the Q&A, but I, I will ask one anyway. Um, one of the things that you've um, obviously mentioned towards the end is uh, how you know you've run uh, uh, courses that were very popular, and you've made the uh, NetPine uh, available on um, uh, via Kubernetes, so you can have multiple logins. How do you handle uh, 
um, not in a technical sense, well, perhaps partially in a technical sense, but more in a uh, sustainability sense. How are, you how are you going to handle when the, uh, the ECAS funding runs out uh, uh, at the end of the year and, uh, and uh, you have, do, are those people able to, uh, people who use NetPine, are they able to create scripts and use Core Neuron and submit uh, large jobs? If so, how do you, uh, how do you handle that? Do they uh, look after their own uh, submissions to Google Cloud or uh, how's that uh, in a sustainable sense? So, yeah, so that was a question that we had to address and uh, we found several solutions. And uh, so one of them is provided by these uh, platforms that I mentioned, the Open Source Brain and the Human Brain Project eBrains platform. They have both offered to host our tool as well. So uh, that would be one solution where they would provide the credits. Uh, however, of course, if the, the actual usage is going to be like running massive simulations, uh, we are working on a solution that allows uh, the users to actually log in into their own Google Cloud accounts uh, through our graphical interface. And then they would be able to use their own Google Cloud credits to submit these kind of simulations. Um, so we're working with the Google Cl Cloud guys to try to implement this. Yeah, thanks, I guess neuro, uh, the Neuroscience Gateway portal also allows us to use resources that are made available from NSF to, to the community. 